Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Lizzie Burden in London, and these are the stories that set your agenda. Taiwan is hit by its biggest earthquake in 25 years, toppling buildings and disrupting chip manufacturing. AP reports at least four people have died. We'll bring you the latest live from Taipei. Stocks slide on fears of a slower pace of rate reductions from the Federal Reserve following more strong data on the U.S. economy. San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly says she still believes there'll be three cuts this year. I think that is a very reasonable baseline, but I would like to say here that a pro- this is a projection, right? Three rate cuts is a projection, and a projection is not a promise. Plus, Presidents Biden and Xi speak for the first time since November. The White House saying the forced sale of TikTok was on the agenda. Well, a very good morning. And we are going to bring you the latest on the Taiwanese earthquake, the worst in 25 years later in the programme. But first, let's get to the market reaction to the latest US economic data. Of course, we've got plenty of that coming out this week. And once again, good news for the economy has proved bad news for markets. It's fueled more speculation that the Fed is going to be in no rush to cut interest rates. And that's not stocks. That's expected to continue later today, as you can see from the futures picture. But if we flip the board over to the cross asset picture, I can show you why. The 10-year yield at 4.35% currently. You had it at its highest levels this year, yesterday. So pretty steady now. But with yields this high, why would you buy stocks? That is the question. Some would say it's because if delayed rate cuts reflect a stronger economy, it's good for equity markets. So isn't it time to buy? Well, we're going to have that debate with Ven Ram from our MLive team later in the programme. But in any case, these are choppy waters. Volatile times when we've got so much economic data coming out. Now all eyes on the Fed Chair Jay Powell. He speaks later today. In the meantime, dollar steady, as is gold, having hit all-time highs. And oil steady too after yesterday's rally. In that sphere, all attention now on the OPEC Plus meeting later today. But let's get back to the Taiwan earthquake. The fire agency in Taiwan is reported as saying four people have been killed in the strongest quake to hit the island in a quarter of a century. Let's get more from Bloomberg's Adrian Kennedy in Taipei. Adrian, what's the latest? As you just said, uh, good morning. Uh, As you just said, four people have been confirmed as dead. Uh, That's our understanding. Um, And there are other people who are thought to be missing and uh, rescue operations are underway in the east of Taiwan, which was the hardest hit. So we were struck at about two minutes to eight o'clock in the morning um, by the strongest quake to hit Taiwan since 1999, when more than 2,400 people died in a Tembla. This time, uh, while buildings shook strongly in Taipei, the capital city appears to have been uh, only minor, minorly affected, um, some subway disruptions, but the stock market was trading again today um, as normal with a little bit lower. Uh, the main impact was in the east in Hualien. Some roads to the area have been closed. Some rail services have been disrupted. This is a relatively remote area. It's quite far from the western side of the island, which is where the main industrial heartland of Taiwan is. In that heartland, in that industrial area, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Co. and uh, United Microelectronics and some other companies immediately uh, suspended some operations and evacuated some staff. But this is something which they do, they go into um, as a matter of course. Taiwan is on an earthquake zone. It's also subject to pretty severe typhoons during the rainy season. Um, And these companies have immediate contingency uh, plans which go into effect. We understand that one refinery may have suspended operations briefly, but it'll be back online this afternoon. So we we are continuing to monitor the situation. The east of Taiwan, which is less populated than the 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 west and then Taipei, is the, the main part that's affected. Okay, Adrian Kennedy, we appreciate that update. Thank you, Uh, Adrian Kennedy in Taipei there. So, of course, the focus very much on the human toll of the Taiwanese quake. But Vonnie Quinn is with us now, and she can bring us up to speed on the market impact across Asia. Vonnie. 
Well, obviously, continuing to assess damage, both human damage, of course, and damage to buildings and also to production lines and so on. We know TSMC already took workers off the production line for today in many factories. It, as Adrian said, hit around 8 o'clock this morning as people would have been about to go to work or at work already. But if we look at the market reaction, it is pretty contained, at least for right now, right? The macro picture around the world perhaps contributing more to this market narrative today than the actual earthquake itself. We are seeing, though, the Taipei uh, main index down about half a percent, and TSMC is contributing a lot to that. It's down about 1%. But again, 1% in the scheme of things, not a huge move, even as we're seeing chip stocks around the world lower today following Intel foundry numbers that really disappointed investors yesterday. I want to point to the Nikkei. It is off again today, another six-tenths of 1%. Again, this macro story and a continuing weaker yen playing into that. As you can see, the yen trading at 151.58. Unchanged right now, but interestingly, Bank of America is out with a note saying, you know, it could be 160 per dollar before the Fed cuts rates. There is no point in the Bank of Japan actually getting involved in this because, you know, that's what everybody is waiting for. They're waiting for the Fed rate cut cycle to begin. And until then, you can forget about trying to actually control movements of the yen. But let's flip up the boards and see what's happening elsewhere because that, that Intel story really is having an impact as well on chip stocks. It's not just the earthquake and the aftermath. As you can see, we are seeing the COSDAQ, so that's the tech-heavy index in South Korea, down about 1%. And that's partially off the back of the Intel news. The foundry was making losses again for another quarter. And then you have China. China continuing to sell off even as we head into two days of holiday in China. Hong Kong does trade on Friday, but China, mainland China, doesn't trade Thursday or Friday. Down about three tenths of a percent on the CSI 300 and the main index, the H shares, down one percent. And again, you're seeing a little currency trouble, right? We're seeing the offshore yuan trade at the widest end of its band, and there was even speculation that it might have traded outside of that, Lizzie, because earlier on some swaps transactions weren't allowed to go through. So that definitely bears watching as well. It feels like the whole world is waiting for the Fed to get going. We'll obviously hear from Fed Chair Powell later Wednesday. Bloomberg's Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. Thank you for that. And we will come on now to the Fed because two Federal Reserve officials say that they still expect the U.S. Central Bank to cut rates three times this year. But San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly says there's no urgency to adjust at the moment. Meanwhile, Cleveland Fed uh, President uh, Loretta Mesta wants more evidence of easing inflation. I continue to think the most likely scenario is that inflation will continue on a downward trajectory to 2 percent over time, but I need to see more data to raise my confidence. For more, I'm joined by Bloomberg's Jill Deese this morning. Jill, look, we're looking ahead to Friday's jobs report, but just walk us through the latest jobs data that we've already had. Yeah, look, Lizzie, I think that at this point, um, what we're really seeing there is that continued uh, resilience within the labor market. Um, we saw from this JOLTS data that job openings um, pretty much unchanged in March versus, uh, versus February, really bang on expectations there. I think this is all kind of combining uh, to not really give us a whole lot of knowledge ahead of what we're ultimately expecting for those non-farm payroll reports once we get those on Friday. A median estimate among economists uh, is that it's still going to be north of 200,000 uh, non-farm payroll. So we'll ultimately see if uh, we, we get those numbers. But it really kind of feeds into this broader narrative, Lizzie, that uh, there's still a, a, this is still a pretty strong economy. I mean, you combine that with uh, some of this pretty strong uh, factory data, the ISM report that we got pretty recently. Uh, this is all kind of, you know, leading into this reason why um, there's a lot of confusion over when exactly uh, the Fed is going to cut interest rates. And even if it's going to continue to be by uh, th three times this year, as they put in their dot plot. Yeah, this is the data that Daly and Mester are waiting for. But just talk us through the difference between what they're expecting and what traders are expecting. You've got a bit of a disparity now. Yeah, uh, Lizzie, so uh, ultimately it, what we're looking at here, both you've got Mester and you've also got Daly saying there, look, um, still probably three interest rate cuts this year. Although I will point out, they did say, you know, we'll see what the data ultimately says. So just saying it's a reasonable expectation for three cuts. Uh, I think what's really interesting about bond traders right now is that they're pricing in somewhere on 70 uh, basis points worth of cuts, which is, you know, because we're below that 75 that's in the dot plot implies that maybe we're only going to 
to see two rate cuts this year. It's just, Lizzie, this is such a far cry from where we were just a few months ago uh, when you th saw the markets being pretty aggressive about expectations for a cut as soon as March. I think it's all just telling you that there's still a lot of resilience within the labor market. We're still not seeing disinflation, um, you know, hitting the way that you'd ultimately want it to, to bring that inflation target back down to the Fed's uh, annual 2%. Uh, it's really, I think, causing some, uh, um, you know, some, some trepidation about whether we're actually going to see cuts as soon as June, as uh, a lot of uh, traders had initially been expecting. Yeah, markets marginally less dovish than the Fed's median dot plots. What a turn of events from the start of the year. Blue Mokes, Jill Desis, we thank you for that analysis. And now we will get back to the geopolitics. President Biden and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping have spoken by phone. It was their first one-on-one -on -one communication since November. And for more, we can bring in Bloomberg's senior reporter on China's economy and government, James Major. James, what stood out to you from these talks? Because I've read your write-up of the readout and it sounds like China was a little more negative than the US on what was said. I think that's a fair, uh, that's a fair read, um, you, you know, but I also think that the readout from the Chinese side was a little more positive than they have been in the past. You know, there was a lot of talk about stability and how, you know, that, you know, they were actually seeing some real actions and uh, since they, the, the two leaders met in November. So there was a lot less sort of carping or complaining about U.S. actions than I think we've seen in previous statements from, from the Chinese government. So uh, you, there was a, you, both sides you know, had a long laundry list of things they discussed and things they you know, wanted to make very clear about. Obviously, China made the, the point that they always do on Taiwan. Um, but I, th I think generally the, the, the discussion seemed to have gone pretty well uh, yeah, and then now we look forward to so Janet Yellen coming in, in a few days. But uh, overall, it seems that they, you know, the both sides had a reasonably cordial discussion. And how does this set the stage, James, for Janet Yellen, the U.S. Treasury Secretary's visit in the coming days, and then Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State's visit in the coming weeks? I think you know the, the both sides have been you know Janet Yellen's been out. She had a, an interview with the Wall Street Journal just before. She's you know made some comments recently. gave a speech where she was you know laying out the things that she was going to speak to you know with the Chinese, uh, much very specifically on questions over capacity, uh, which you know the U.S. has been talking more and more about. You know, whether that's whether you know she will actually go into the details of various sectors, I think will be will remain to be seen. But clearly, the U.S. government is concerned about. Uh, what they see is Chinese overcapacity leading to a uh, flood of exports going overseas. Um, and there was also discussions on, on, on a number of the other issues that they have. Obviously, fentanyl is a big one, and you know, we'll see if Janet Yellen actually speaks to that. But when the, the, the working group on fentanyl met here earlier this year, there was members of the Treasury, uh, people from the Treasury, and people from the People's Bank of China who were part of that trying to, look at work about, uh, trying to talk about how to stop currency flows and illicit currency flows related to the drug trade. So, you know, there is a lot of different things that, that uh, they have to work on. Uh, yeah, we're also heading to the IMF meetings in a few weeks. And so questions of uh, debt relief for, for developing nations and how, you know, countries like Zambia and other places, how does China and the U.S. cooperate so that those countries can actually see real debt relief, I think will also be high on the agenda for Yellen's visit. OK, so this phone call really setting the stage for much more diplomacy to come. Many thanks. Bloomberg's James Mager in Beijing. Well, we've got plenty more still ahead on the docket for today. Lots of eco data. At 8 a.m. UK time, we get Turkish inflation. Economists reckon it jumped again in March from already 67.1% in February. There just seems to be no stopping it. Our economists seeing it hitting 70% by May, which puts into perspective Euro area CPI. That lands at 10 a.m. UK time. It's expected to have inched closer towards the ECB's 2% target in March, with a June rate cut looking, looking increasingly like a done deal. And then finally at 5, 10 p.m. London time, we'll hear from the man himself, Fed Chair Jay Powell. So we'll keep an eye across all of that. But coming up, U.S. President Joe Biden says Israel isn't doing enough to protect civilians in Gaza after seven aid workers were killed in Israeli airstrikes. We'll have more on that for you next. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now we're going to get the latest on the geopolitical situation in the Middle East next. Of course, again, the human toll really is the focus, the death of aid workers in Gaza. But it has to be said that the geopolitical risk is feeding into the oil price. And we have seen some pretty immense action in the oil space. You see WTI crude hitting $85 a barrel for the first time since October, currently trading at $85. $18. And you've seen Brent at $89 a barrel as well. Now, questions are flying as to whether this is really because of the geopolitical risk and China optimism or whether it might be actually about falling inventories. I got a note yesterday from SEB's commodities team pointing out that, and I quote, not a single drop of oil has been lost due to recent events in the Middle East, except for some rerouting around Africa. Rather, what you've got is a tight market and a steadfast OPEC Plus. Now, OPEC Plus meets online today. It's expected to affirm its current output cuts. But if we just flip on, we've got a chart of this. In fact, you can see that OPEC is still producing above quota. So there's still room to cut. There is still room for further tightness in this market. We will keep across the oil price for you. As I say, it may be, it is at least to some degree affected by the geopolitical risk in the Middle East. And we can get into that now. President Biden says Israel is not doing enough to protect civilians in Gaza. That's after an airstrike by the Israeli military killed seven aid workers in airstrikes. Let's get more now from Bloomberg's Stuart Livingston Wallace. Stuart, great to have you with us. I wonder whether the death of these Western aid workers is going to be the last straw that really brings home the impact brings the US and the UK to bear down on Israel and stop the invasion of Rafa? Yeah, morning, Lizzie. I, I mean, I think the short answer to that question is no, it's probably not the last thing. Uh, I mean, in terms of the, the current Israeli government, they've made it absolutely clear that they still have this singular goal of eliminating the Hamas leadership. And again, they can't do that uh, unless they're sort of active on the ground. So, you know, will this be the, the, the final leg of the war? Uh, possibly. It depends what kind of time frame you're looking at. But, you know, is this basically the, the, the end of relations or international relations between Israel and the rest of the world? No, I don't think it is. Yeah, it seems to just be tough talk still. Uh, and I also wonder whether we've had any more clarity on what Iran's response is going to be uh, to the strike on its consulate in Damascus. Do you think that it's going to retaliate against the US because of its relationship with Israel? Yeah, I mean, we have a bit of precedent to work with here, and obviously it's always quite dangerous to predict what uh, Iran's government may or may not do. But if we think back to, to uh, 2020, when they, uh, the U.S. eliminated Soleimani, who was sort of one of the key leaders uh, in the Iranian military, um, but it didn't really uh, trigger any sort of major response from Iran. I think Iran has always been quite careful about confronting uh, uh, either the U.S. or Israel or Western allies directly. You know, by and large, it doesn't like to play that game. It, it prefers, much prefers to operate through its proxies across the region. You know, in some respects, it's always at arm's length. Uh, and I think that if there was to be any sort of direct attack on Israel, that obviously raises the risk that both Israel and the U.S. would respond in kind, if not uh, more severely. And that's probably not something that Tehran really wants to get involved with right now. OK, Bloomberg Stuart Livingston Wallace, thank you for that update on the situation in the Middle East. Now coming up, Senegal's new president sworn in, becoming Africa's youngest ever elected leader. We'll discuss what investors should be watching out for. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. It's 6.23 in London, but we'll head to Africa now because Senegal's new president, Basu Diomai Faye, has been sworn in and he becomes Africa's youngest elected leader, less than three weeks after being released from prison to run in last month's election. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Ondiro Oganga in Kigali. Ondiro, President Faye's economic policies are really quite different from the former president, Macky Sall's. What should investors brace for? 
Investors should be looking forward to having a leader in President Basir Rafai. He's adopted a very diplomatic and leadership tone. He says he wants to continue working with Senegal's foreign partners and deepen their relations. Um, though he had said that he's going to renegotiate contracts, that might delay projects that have already delayed further. So what they're going to do is review these contracts individually and see if there's an opportunity to make more revenue for the country. Cosmos Energy is expecting a business-friendly environment. BP says they're hoping to build a conducive working relationship with the president. U.S. and France are hoping to deepen their relations. So everybody is quite optimistic. And Faiz also named his prime minister. Why is that significant? Because these are two opposition leaders that went from being in jail three weeks ago to presidency and premiership, respectively. During the campaign season that lasted barely two weeks, we saw um, opposition leader Usman Sonko back then rally his support behind fire and say, Diamoye is Sonko. And so we saw him winning the elections 54%, the first time that an opposition candidate had ever done that in office. Since his appointment, um, Usman Sonko has said that he's not going to leave fire alone to lead the country. In fact, he's already prepared a list of appointments for ministers that he will present to the president for his approval. All right, Bloomberg's Ondiro Oganga with the latest on the Senegalese election and what to expect as we move forward. Thank you for that. And as a reminder, don't forget to catch Africa Amplified. It comes this Friday, our monthly deep dive into Africa's biggest stories. This week, the show takes a look at the historic rise in cocoa prices. Ouch, I like chocolate. And why the same factors are impacting other soft commodities on the continent. So don't forget to catch that at 5.30 a.m. UK time. Well, speaking of cocoa, if we just stick on the Ivory Coast, specifically the weather there and its impact on this commodity, just take a look at that. You've had cocoa futures hitting a fresh record record yesterday. Then they took a bit of a dip. But cocoa prices having more than doubled this year on lower West African production. The 60-day measure of volatility is at about its highest in 15 years. So another corner of the market, you might say, where volatility is the watchword. Not so good, however, for our favourite confectionery, which is making me a little peckish at this time of the morning. But coming up, volatility, as I say, is the watchword as we have all of this UK, US economic data this week. And it's been dampening hopes of further rate cuts from the Federal Reserve. We've had more strong data on the US economy, which we'll bring you more on next. So stay with us for that as we look at futures stateside pointing to a lower opening this morning as they do here in Europe. Eurostoxx 50 futures flat to the downside. S&P EMEs down two tenths of a percent and so are Nasdaq futures. We'll have more on the markets for you coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Lizzie Verdon in London, and these are the stories that set your agenda. Taiwan is hit by its biggest earthquake in 25 years, toppling buildings and disrupting chip manufacturing, with at least four people reported dead. We'll bring you the latest live from Taipei. Stocks slide on fears of a slower pace of rate reductions from the Federal Reserve, following more strong data on the U.S. economy. San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly says she still believes there'll be three cuts this year. I think that is a very reasonable baseline, but I would like to say here that a pro this is a projection, right? Three rate cuts is a projection, and a projection is not a promise. Plus, President Biden and she speak for the first time since November. The White House saying the forced sale of TikTok was on the agenda. 
Well, good morning. We're going to bring you the latest on the impact of the Taiwan earthquake, its market impact in just a moment. But first, let's get you up to speed on these markets. As you can see here, futures pointing to a lower opening on both sides of the pond. And it comes back to the latest U.S. economic data. Good news for the economy, proving bad news for markets once again. You've seen traders pairing back their bets on Fed rate cuts. In fact, at the margin... The market looking actually less dovish than the Fed now. What a change from the start of the year. But as you saw yesterday, if we flip the board over to the cross asset picture, the US 10 year yield hitting the highest level this year off the back of this repricing of Fed cuts. And then that leaves the question, why buy stocks when you've got yields this high? You might say you should buy stocks because the reason for the repricing is because of a good economy, which is surely good for equities. We're going to get into that debate with M Live's Ven Ram in just a moment. But in any case, this is a volatile time and we've got much more economic data to come this week. Of course, the US jobs report on Friday. And in the meantime, we get the Fed chair, Jay Powell, speaking later today. As we await that, you've got the dollar steady, gold pretty steady as well, having hit all time highs. And oil, pretty steady there too. Brent to $89 a barrel as attention turns to the OPEC Plus meeting at which we're expecting those supply cuts to be confirmed. But let's get back to the Taiwanese earthquake and how it's impacting markets in Asia and other things that are happening in Asia markets. We've got Bloomberg's Vonnie Quinn on standby for us in Dubai. Vonnie, what's happening? Well, Lizzie, we're continuing to see fallout, particularly as regards officials inspecting in sites and buildings that have fallen down. We know at least 26 buildings have collapsed and that, unfortunately, four individuals at least have died. That's according to the local fire service. Markets-wise, we know that some chip factories, for example, have evacuated workers and so on. The earthquake hitting at around 8 a.m. local time, so around the time people would have been going to work or at work. That includes TSMC, and that did take a hit in trading but some of the macro factors that are affecting stocks around the world that are trading are also impacting Taiwanese shares at the moment. And as you can see, the impact is fairly contained, at least market-wise. We're down about six-tenths of a percent on the TIEX. And then Taiwan Semiconductor, down about one and a quarter percent for now. Don't forget, there is a poll over chip stocks today at the moment anyway, because Intel's foundry business reported that it had a loss yesterday and also uh, revenue that was much less than expected. So shares around the world, including in South Korea, in chip stocks are lower. I want to point to the Nikkei too. It is down again. Another down session for Japan shares, but eight tenths of one percent. So we'll have to see where that money is flowing. There was a suggestion it might start flowing into China. We'll see about that. The yen trading at 151.59. Bank of America out with a note today saying that the yen could go to 160 and that if the BOJ does intervene, it won't matter anyway until the Fed starts its rate cutting cycle. Let's flip up the boards because it does appear that many central banks around the world are waiting for the Fed to start its cycle. And not just central banks, but economies in general. So we also have China waiting for this to happen, right? We have better economic data out of China, also not helping China shares. So the CSI 300 had another down day, the Shanghai Shenzhen Stock Exchange really just not feeling the better data. It's not lifting sentiment. We also had that currency trading at very close to the weakest part of its band on shore. And that's something that's very unusual and shows that the central bank is trying to defend its currency. All right, Bloomberg's Bonnie Quinn, thank you for that um, impact of Federal Bank, Federal Reserve cut bets being uh, repriced on Asia markets. And we continue our conversation now about the Federal Reserve because two officials have said that they still expect the U.S. Central Bank to cut rates three times this year. San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly says there's no urgency to adjust at the moment. And meanwhile, Cle Cleveland Fed's Loretta Mester wants more evidence of easing inflation. For more on this, we could bring in Ven Ram from Bloomberg's M Live team. Ven, I've promised that you'd settle a debate for us here. We've seen the impact on stocks where good news seems to be bad news once again. If you've got a stronger economy, surely that's good for equities. Surely it's time to buy. Absolutely. You're hitting the nail on the head, Lissy, because that's exactly how the equities have been trading. And that's why we've seen the humongous rally over the past few months. Now, there are two sides to the equities coin. One is the interest rate story. The other is the growth story. 
if you look at the interest rate story, yes, if rates are sticky, but they are going to go lower from here. And that's what, at least, uh, uh, barring a reacceleration of inflation, that's how the lay of the land looks. But if you look at the growth story, that's why investors are getting really excited. Because if you're going to get corporate earnings growth of 20, 25, 30 percent, and you have seen those numbers un underpinning, you know, the tech stocks in particular. I mean, those are humongous earnings blowout numbers. And those are what, that's what is underpinning stocks at the moment. If you look at the S&P 500, you could get an earnings yield of just about just under 5% at the moment, prospective earnings yield. Uh, if you look at the Nasdaq, you're getting a prospective earnings yield of less than 4%. But that 4%, less than 4% needs to be seen in the context, as I said, of overwhelming earnings growth and potential and with the AI coming on the horizon that's exactly what investors are uh, lining up for and so far they haven't been disappointed. Okay so that's the US stock story but how much risk is there for European currencies as Fed cuts seem an ever more distant prospect at least to some? Well, definitely the dollar has uh, found itself a bit in the past few months, uh, notwithstanding what happened yesterday. But, you, you know, European currencies and even the yen are going to find it wobbly from here because, you know, uh, the pound has already given up its gains for the year. And that's going to be a continuing story through the second quarter because if the Fed is not going to cut rates, real rates in the U.S. are going to stay elevated. And we've already seen the 10-year uh, real yield back up to 2% levels in the U.S. And that provides humongous comfort for investors chasing real coupons. And that means that the dollar is going to continue to be on the front foot, putting the European currencies somewhat wobbly, in a somewhat wobbly position. OK, euro dollar currently 107. We'll keep an eye on it as we await that European CPI figure at 10 a.m. London time. Bloomberg's Ben Ram, we thank you for your analysis. Now, Bloomberg has learned that NATO Secretary Jen Stoltenberg is proposing to establish a fund of contributions worth $100 billion over five years for Ukraine. This comes as foreign ministers from the alliance gather in Brussels to mark the group's 75th anniversary. Let's get more now from Bloomberg's EMEA News Director, Ros Matheson. Ros, what more do we know about this proposal? How significant is it? Well, as you say, there's two aspects to it, actually. One is this fund, which would be 100 billion dollars over five years. The other part of it is actually baking the operational responsibility for weapons deliveries into NATO itself. Right now, it's being led largely by the US, what's known as the Ukraine Contact Defense Group. And what they'll be doing is absorbing that back into NATO um, as part of this proposal that could be discussed at this meeting today and tomorrow. And the idea really uh, is to ring fence this aid to Ukraine over a protracted period out of concern, partly because of the U.S. political environment and the prospect that Donald Trump may be back in the White House after the next U.S. election. Of course, he's been quite critical of the aid to Ukraine, critical of NATO also over the years and suggested the U.S. could pull funding for both. And the idea is, given the political climate in the U.S., whether it's Donald Trump or Joe Biden right now uh, back in the White House, there is that, that sort of sense of concern about whether the U.S. can continue to support the aid flows to Ukraine. We've seen that $60 billion package still stuck in Congress many, many months later. And so the idea is really to, to sort of shield some of this via the NATO machinery. The question is, will that be successful? It will be discussed today. There may not be entire support for it amongst NATO members, but certainly it's the most important thing on the table for discussion. Yeah, I was going to ask you what happens to this funding if Trump gets in. But what else, Ros, is going to be on the agenda for NATO members at this meeting? Well, aside from this, the leadership of NATO itself is going to be discussed. Of course, there's still that question of who's going to replace Jen Stoltenberg at some point. Uh, there had been a coalescent around uh, the outgoing Dutch Prime Minister, Mark Rutte. He seemed to be the lead candidate. But now some of the Baltic states have put some support behind Romania, uh, the Romanian president, uh, Klaus, uh, that he might actually be someone that they want to support. It does seem as though you know, most of the support, again, is behind Mark Rutte, but there will be that conversation about who's going to lead NATO into possibly a really different environment over the next five years. You've got not just the conflict in Ukraine still going. You've got fundamental questions about Europe's self-defence uh, in, in an era where Vladimir Putin might be casting his gaze further towards Europe. You've got the conflict that's going on 
in the Middle East, you've got tension still between the US and China. In that complex environment, you need someone who's going to be able to lead NATO and all the members uh, in some sort of unity. So it really is a fundamental question. That's going to be the other major topic for discussion today. Yeah, historic times, not a job I'd want. Bloomberg's EMEA News Director, Ros Matheson, thank you for that preview of the NATO meeting. Now, to some other stories that are making news. Intel shares fell in U.S. extended trading after it said its manufacturing operation losses have deepened and the business may not reach a break-even point for several years yet. Intel Foundry, a new division responsible for manufacturing, had sales of nearly $19 billion in 2023, down from $28 billion the previous year. Elsewhere, Endeavor Group, the controlling investor in WWE and the ultimate fighting championship, has agreed to be acquired by private equity company Silver Lake Management. The $13 billion buyout follows through on plans announced in October. Endeavor said at the time that it was evaluating strategic options out of frustration with the company's languishing stock price. Well, coming up, we're going to discuss the companies to watch in the second quarter. Bloomberg Intelligence gives us their top 10 picks next. So stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. To the corporate now, Tesla shares slumped after the EV maker's first quarter deliveries missed estimates by the biggest margin in seven years. Tesla shipped just under 387,000 vehicles and average estimates were for 449,000. We can find out why now with our Asia Transport reporter, Linda Liu. Linda, just talk us through what's gone wrong for Tesla. There's this whole range of uh, factors that Tesla is really finding challenging. Um, the global EV demand is softening right now um, across markets like the US and EU. You've got uh, Tesla's second largest market, China, going through this intense price war in the auto market with a lot of EV makers discounting prices. And you've also got supply chain disruptions with um, the Red Sea attacks by the Houthis that have led to production disruptions in Tesla's Berlin plant. So all of this have added together to paint quite a bleak picture for Tesla. And we're seeing that in their delivery numbers. And rather selfishly, Linda, I'm wondering what could be the read across for Europe on the wider industry, of course, as well? Yeah, in Europe, um, the EV markets actually had a strong start to the year in January. Uh, the sales of battery electric vehicles rose uh, more than 20%. But coming into February, that slowed down a little bit. So that could cast some doubt with how well demand is going to hold up for the rest of the year. If demand continues to soften and Tesla, which only sells uh, battery electric vehicles, that could really impact um, Tesla's sales going forward. And all eyes are also watching for the results of the anti-subsidy investigation into Chinese EVs. And um, if there's going to be additional import tariffs on Chinese EVs, that could slow uh, the arrival of more affordable EVs from China into the European market, which can contribute to this uh, weakening demand for EVs. All right, Bloomberg's Asia Transport reporter, Linda Liu, thanks for that update on Musk's woes and, of course, the China story and the European potential read across as well. But we're going to stick with the corporate. Bloomberg Intelligence has identified 10 companies to watch in 2024's second quarter. Spanning various sectors and regions, they're part of a larger group of high-confidence focus ideas that BI analysts flag on an ongoing basis. Well, we could get more now from Bloomberg Intelligence Director of Research and European strategist Tim Craighead. Happy Q2 before we start, Tim. It's like and it's not April Fool's either. <laughs> I love this piece, especially the uh, illustrations of companies as apples. They reminded me of Humpty Dumpty bright in my morning. Why have you picked these? How did you get to... Uh, the, what's the methodology? Yeah, so... Uh, these ten are, as you had said, part of a broader group of what we call focus ideas. Mm. Focus ideas have three elements. One, a high conviction fundamental view. 
Number two, that we think is different from what the market is thinking. And number three, quite critically, there are catalysts ahead to bring the market around to our point of view. And these 10 specifically have important catalysts coming up in 2Q, therefore the 10 companies to watch in the second quarter. Okay, well, it's looked like a bleak day on the markets this morning. So for anyone who wants a little inspiration, just talk us through the three out of 10 that are based in Europe. Yeah, sure thing. So it's uh, quite diverse. Uh, Accor, uh, Pirelli, and Standard Chartered. So Accor, the hotel company, wide range of properties, uh, in particular with a lot of exposure to Europe, and Asia, we see a travel recovery continuing to uh, progress, uh, surprisingly, better than, it's better than expected. And in specifically for Accor, don't forget, we've got the Paris Olympics coming up. And this French company, N2Q, should give us some early insight on how bookings are coming up. So interesting little twist. The other one's in a nutshell, Pirelli, the tire company. We all know them. If you watch F1, you see their, their tires flowing along. They've gotten an important mix shift going higher and higher end, and they're shifting production to lower cost um, areas such as Romania and Mexico. Um, we think there's, there's a profit surprise to come. And the last the standard chartered on the big bank with a big Asia focus, mm -hmm. uh, we think they have resolved their China risk when it comes to property exposure. But there's not enough appreciation for what's going on with their wealth management business, which we think can surprise. Okay, that's interesting because we've often had Bill Winters, the CEO, right here on Bloomberg Daybreak. And he's been telling us that story. You believe him over at VI. Indeed. Um, let's just also compare this to the list that you released at the start of the year. It's an ongoing basis you do this. Are there any newcomers and are there any broader themes that connect some of the other companies to watch on the list? Yeah, absolutely. So it's absolutely um, newcomers. And interesting one, it's not a European company, a U.S. company called Penumbra. Um, frankly, I wasn't aware of it until we picked up Good, coverage. Neither was I. Yeah, there you are. They make computer-assisted vacuum technology, and you say, what is that? Um, it's essentially little micro items that go in and they suck out blood clots um, for stroke or pre-stroke um, victims. Uh, much better in ways than using anticoagulant drugs that have all sorts of other um, uh, issues. So cool technology, cool company, and they've got new products that are coming through. Another one um, uh, is sort of AI related. Salesforce, uh, the big uh, infrastructure software company. Mm. Um, <clears throat> There's an IT spending cycle that continues to gain steam, and you really need their data for training certain elements of AI within corporate projects. And so we think there's two wins behind Salesforce to drive better than expected results. And you're not the only ones behind Salesforce. Of course, uh, Albert Einstein's estate has faith in them. They've yeah. just given them the IP to his face to be the logo. But so what are the headwinds that could potentially face these different companies? You've kind of touched on China. Yep. What else could knock these winners you've picked? <clears throat> well, I indeed, I I'll I'll keep on China. Um, there's two that are negative of the 10. Um, both of them happen to be China-oriented uh, items. Uh, one is Chow Tai Fook, a uh, big Hong Kong jeweler retailer. Um, it's representative of a broader focus idea we have on Hong Kong retail, where we do think that there is risks ahead. Um, Hong Kongers are going across the border and shopping in China and elsewhere for lower prices, and it's impacting uh, Hong Kong retail sales. Um, another is CSC Financial, which is a very large Chinese broker, um, and they're with a focus um, from a policy perspective on the markets and sort of containing supply. We think that the IPO market and other listings are going to disappoint, and CSC you know, is in the front of that. Okay, Tim Craighead, thank you for that. And as I say, definitely worth checking out. Bloomberg Intelligence Director of Research and European Strategist Tim Craighead with Bloomberg Intelligence's uh, 10 companies to watch. I love the apples, <laughs> the Humpty Dumpties of companies. Plenty more still to come. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. The most likely scenario is that inflation will continue on a downward trajectory to 
over time, but I need to see more data to raise my confidence. Some further monthly readings will give us a better sense of whether the disinflation process is stalling out or whether the start of the year readings uh, reflect a temporary detour on the downward path back to price stability. Three rate cuts is a projection, and a projection is not a promise. And I think that's really important because a projection is saying, here's how the economy is expected to evolve, and here's how policy evolve should that occur. But you have to maintain this ready position, and I feel like we're in a very good place to be ready. We have to be ready for what if inflation's stickier than, than we projected or I projected. If I look at my projection and I say, well, what if inflation's stickier? We may want to cut less. So Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester and Mary Daly, the San Francisco Fed President, speaking there on the U.S. policy outlook. No rush to cut rates is the conclusion from both of them. Will that narrative be confirmed by Fed Chair Jay Powell when he speaks later today? Probably is what the markets reckon. And why? It comes back to data dependence, of course. We've had more data surprising to the upside yesterday. Of course, we had job openings and then we had factory openings as well. You can see it here rebounding from that January slump. And there's more data to come this week. The main jobs report, of course, on Friday. So a lot of potential for volatility. If we flip the board, you can see Cities Global Economic Surprise Index near a one... A, a one-year high. And if we flip again, you've got traders pricing fewer than three cuts from the Fed this year. What a change from the start of the year. Markets marginally less dovish than the Fed. They're going to talk about that on markets today next. So stay with us. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> 